I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have just a, a couple of comments. Um, I want to just make, make everyone aware, the public aware, that, that we are now beginning the more public part of the budget process uh, starting in March. Patrick and the uh, administrative team have been working diligently to um, bring proposals forward and um, working with Deb um, in, the, in the fiscal office to put uh, presentations together. The, the Finance Committee um, is going to meet on March 3rd and again on March 9th. Second. Oh, should be the second. Second and ninth. Okay, that's a correction. March 2nd and 9th uh, to begin to go over the detail of the budget recommendations, the budget proposals. Those meetings, just to remind everyone, those meetings have been moved to the afternoon. They're going to be at uh, 3 to 6.30, and we're doing that primarily to um, uh, facilitate board participation for those of you on the board who have to work. And, and I do want to make, make sure folks are clear that these are public, uh, these are public meetings. There, there isn't an opportunity in these workshops for the, for the public to participate and, and uh, to discuss with the board. That, that's not really the format. But it is, uh, for those interested, it is an opportunity for uh, the public to come in and, and to listen to the presentations. And um, the board will ask questions, and, and hopefully everyone will come away with a, with a better understanding and a detailed understanding of, of what's in the budget. Um, so th those two finance committee meetings are being held. Patrick will then go back and refine the budget. Um, there will be a. Uh, a general board meeting, a, a public board meeting on the 23rd, and there's an opportunity there to discuss budget issues. And the first reading of, of the budget will be March 30th, right? And, and that will be a, a public session here at the middle school to uh, uh, discuss, for, well, Patrick will present the budget, and again, an opportunity for the board and for the public uh, to ask questions. It, it really is my hope that we'll get more public participation in this process up front. And, and you know, it, it has been, uh, uh, certainly I'll raise it as a concern of mine that, that many comments come to the board uh, at the town hall meeting on the budget and, and the, the, the concerns are legitimate. I, I have no issue at all with the, with the comments and recommendations and suggestions that, that, the, that folks in the public raise, but it would be helpful, it would be very useful if those observations, comments, and, and concerns come forward earlier in the budget process so that we have an opportunity to fully discuss them and to accommodate them within, within the budget, within the proposed budget. Uh, it, it is it's just very difficult, obviously. Um, I guess Topsom might be a, a better example of that, or, or um, uh, 75, school district 75, where they had a $500,000 item added to the budget at the last minute. Uh, I, don't, I certainly don't expect that to happen here in the RSU, but, but I think you know, th those, are, uh, those kinds of things, obviously, are just very difficult to deal with at the last minute. So again, hopefully uh, folks will, will raise concerns and bring them uh, forward to the board, to um, your individual board members, bring the comments out publicly, however you want to do it. But we'd like to hear from the public on, on the proposed budget as we, as we begin to shape it. Um, I think that's it. I just wanted to, uh, to, to put that out there and, and um, let's move on with the agenda. Uh, item 4.0, we have the uh, minutes from the meeting of January 27th. Do I have a motion to approve? Hold, hold, hold. I'll 
Second. We have a motion by Bill, second by Lou. Uh, take a look at the minutes. Any comments, corrections? No? Okay. All in favor of the minutes? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, item 5.0, adjustments to the agenda. Um, Vita put a couple, a couple of additional policy. These are these are both for first reading. Oh, one. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So there's just one uh, additional item, and it's a first reading. Uh, it's for board member use of social media, and it is policy B E B. So let's add that to under. Agenda item 12.2. We'll add that as, as one of the first as one of the uh, policies for first reading. Anything else, Patrick? No. <clears throat> okay. Item 6.0. Uh, this is our first public session. If anyone in the public has any comments that they would like to make relative to items on the agenda. If not, okay. Item 7.0, staff report, Patrick. I'd like to thank Lisa Hardman, who is our um, librarian uh, ed tech at Dyke Newell, and also Jen McKay for coming out this evening. And you can tell from the, the board up there, they're gonna cover some enrichment opportunities, um, some to do with a reader's theater and some to do with some of our STEAM programming. So thank you for being here and we'll have you come up. was here a couple of months ago when we did the board workshop about STEAM in our district, and when Patrick asked if there were any um, school-wide presentations that could come before the board, I reached out to Lisa immediately to see if she would come and share some of the things that she's doing through our library at school. I'm sure many of you are familiar with how school libraries are evolving in public schools so that they are not just um, about books and reading anymore, but they're also expanding to include technology and connecting our curriculum with different STEAM opportunities for students. And Lisa certainly has been working very hard on that at our school. And so I'm, I'm really happy that she could be here tonight to share some of that work with you. Um, if you look at the Maine Association of School Libraries, they've expanded the job description for school librarians and library ed techs to include many different things now, not just being advocates for reading and for literacy, but connecting kids with technology and connecting students with different opportunities to be creative, to collaborate, to discover and to work together. And I think the programs that Lisa has started to do with our students at Dyke Newell are great examples of that. And so I will let her tell you all about them. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, this is my third year at Dyke Newell. And I had done theater when I was at Wiscasset, and I really enjoyed doing it with my students. And I had never done it with second grade before. I'd always done it with fourth grade. And it has really gone well, and I wanted to share that with you first. Um, second graders have three opportunities to be in um, plays during the year, and they're selected by me or by their teacher. Uh, we look for kids who are doing what they're supposed to be doing in their class. Um, but we try to get some of the shy ones to get them out there. Um, this is the first play I ever did um, at Dyke Newell. This is uh, The Three Billy Goats Gruff. And it, the kids that, every, you wouldn't believe how many kids want to be in the plays. And I can't have everybody. I, I usually have one to three from each class, so you know, 12 tops. So at the end of the year, we do skits, and the um, students who didn't get selected any of them can be in the skits, and they will do it for one class. So this was one of our skits called The Dentist, which was a big hit. And again, um, behavior ex expectations, once they're in a play, they have to keep up with their work because they miss um, one afternoon of writing for rehearsal. So if they're not doing their classroom work, they may have to be replaced. 
Um, we look for kids that are uh, positive role models for their peers. Um, just, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. But again, we do try to get some of the quiet ones. These are some of the benefits of Reader's Theatre. Um, the last one with the positive peer relations, I've, I have noticed that my students who are in plays together seem to gravitate towards each other on the playground afterwards. They really make long-lasting friendships. But it really engages them in the material. So Donors Choose, I, are you familiar with Donors Choose? It's a, a place where um, teachers can post projects and then get pun funded by the public. And I have gotten all our scripts are from them, all of our uh, masks and accessories. And it really helps bring the productions to life for the kids. So we also have scripts for other things. And I tend to use them in class. We may not perform them, but we read them along with what we're doing in class. Um, like for science, there's one on like the Earth's continents and the different planets. Um, we have math ones where they can do math at the farmer's market and just, just different ones. And these are some of the books we've gotten. We have traditional fairy tales, uh, fractured fairy tales. Uh, those are modern fairy tales based on the old ones, but they've kind of twisted it and made it funny, and, and the kids really like those. Uh, Spiderella is the favorite so far. Uh, the Cheetah and the Sloth, though, has gone over well, too. Our first play this year was Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and um, we did this one for uh, kindergarten, and pre-K came, too. So before we do a play for a grade, we will read a bunch um, in their classes. So first grade heard all of these um, different versions. The, uh, I'm trying to see, Goldilocks and the Three Dinosaurs by Mo Willems was probably our favorite. I have found at Dyke Newell, if I need anything for a play, I can count on my staff to find it for me. I had this within 10 minutes of asking, and it was perfect. We would just prop it up, and if she leaned to the left, it would collapse, and, and it did it every time. It never malfunctioned. Um, I needed dog ears for another play, and Kathy Hendrickson went home and felted me some dog ears, and I had them the next day. I need dresses for our next play, uh, girl size eight, if anybody has any extras at home. Um, the narrators really have to practice speaking slowly and telling the story and remembering when to pause, and so we had three for this one, and they were all excellent. I was just going to have her pretend to be eating, but I noticed it was a, a lot more enthusiasm when we put some pudding in there, so we kept it, and that was like going around the school that Miss Hardman was letting kids have pudding in the library. So, and they, they really, this group did a great job. They were really excited. And they're always really sad when it's over and they can't come at recess anymore to practice. So our next play we did this year was Chicken Little. This one I really tried to take some of the quiet kids that I usually can't get to talk very much. Um, but for Foxy Loxy, I did pick a child that had been really, um, did a lot of voices when he was in class and when we did plays. So these are some of the different Chicken Littles that we read. Stephen Kellogg has a lot of um, he, he always adds stuff, so like in this one, Foxy Loxy was actually disguised as a police officer trying to get the birds. And this is our narrator. Um, we had her be an owl, and she actually was up in a tree and dropped the acorn on, on Chicken Little's head, and she hit him every time. She had remarkable. So, um, we had read several different versions, and sometimes the birds escape, and sometimes th they don't. And so when we got to this part of the play, the audience every time would gasp, and you, know, and you could hear them discussing, is this going to be one where they get away, or are they going to be eaten? And as you can see, they were eaten. <laughs> this, this kid was he, just great. He did a wonderful job. The walk he had when he had his full stomach. So our, our last play this year will be The Frog Prince. Um, and we just started before vacation, and probably in April we will do it. So, and this is what we're going to be reading, some different versions. Um, this was the f one of the first plays I did at Dyke Newell. I just wanted to show you a few pictures of the, the tortoise and the hare, little red hen. All of these masks and hats and aprons, these are all from Donors Choose. This was my favorite, the Bremontown Rappers. And they actually did rap songs, and it was quite funny. So. I was um, on Lakeshore Learning looking for a puppet theater, and I happened to see these 
STEM fairy tale problem solving kits. And as we had been doing, you know, the Reader's Theater with fairy tales, and I read a lot of fairy tales to them, I was intrigued, so I looked closer, and I put a Donors Choose grant up, and we were able to get them. We got three of them. And they combine classic stories with hands-on activities. Um, we have a puppet theater, too, that has stories that go along with all the kits. Um, and these are some of the learning goals. Um, but really, just getting kids to work together and design, and they have to work as a team. They can't be an individual doing it. That's probably been our biggest challenge is because everybody wants to be in control, and they're all trying to man it. Um, so this is the Three Little Pigs kit. And these are the supplies that come with it. And their challenge is they have to build a house that all three pigs can fit in. And it has to be strong enough that it can't be blown down by the wolf. But they actually have to make it pretty airtight. And they've really struggled with getting the roof on and making it airtight. And then everybody wants to be the person who tries to blow on it, which with the flu and everything, I have to like pick one person and everybody stands back. And, but they've had a really good time with that one. Um, and these are some of the things that they, like the design and the gravity and force they have to try out. Working with a partner, though, is by far the biggest challenge for these kids is, you know, like working together instead of each person trying to do their own thing. So this is um, Albert and Suli, and this is their house that they designed. And they, they were really, um, kids struggled with this one. This was probably one of the better houses I saw. But these three were amazing. They, um, I had never had these kids work together. I had never seen them hanging out with each other. And they just brought out the best. And I, they did a, a great bridge that we're going to talk about later. But I really enjoyed them. So, and we also read several different versions and, and used the puppet theater. And these are all the different versions of the Three Little Pigs we read. Uh, let me see. The, real, the true story of the Three Little Pigs is really a funny one. It's told from the wolf's perspective and why he was really going around to the houses. And he says he was framed, so the kids always enjoy that one. So, the next kit was the Three Billy Goats Gruff. And they have to build a bridge that is high enough that the troll can stand up underneath it, but strong enough to support the weight of all three of the goats. And this was really tough for them. The bridges were collapsing. Um, it's all connected with Velcro. So it, the group of three that I had just shown you, I heard the little boy saying that we need more supports. And I, I swear I had like a team of engineers in there, just the words they were using while they were talking about it. So, and they, again, the, they were so frustrated when they would collapse, and it was a really good lesson on persevering and trying again. And so this is um, one that some of the second grade had done. If you notice, one side has good supports, and the other side looks like it could go easy, but it did stand up. This one, however, these girls whipped this up in five minutes. Everybody else would spend about 20, 25 minutes, and it was tiny. But it was sturdy. They, they could fit them all on there. It was strong. A lot of kids would try to have the um, troll's head be part of the support, which you know I tried to explain that you couldn't do that. But, you know. And then we did the puppet theater again. And these are some of the different ones we read. Um, the Three Silly Girls Grub is about three girls trying to get to school. And there's ugly boy Bobby underneath the bridge who keeps trying to stop them. And it's, real, it's very funny, very funny. So we also have a Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but that one's probably the easiest. They're making chairs for each of them. So. Last week, I got a Donors Choose grant, and these are the new ones that should be coming this week. And these ones, have, they're more steam-based, so there will be an art component with these ones as well. Um, and I also got kits for making boats and airplanes, so we will be trying those out too. The last thing I was going to talk about was the Bee Bots. And these are robots that kids can, the little bee robots, and they can program them to move certain ways. And it introduces them to coding. Laura Phelps had gotten us um, five from the Perlaw Foundation. And I have to admit, I was a little reluctant to try them at first, because my brain does not work this way. And especially when we're moving them backwards, the kids at first could do circles around me. I will say I've gotten a lot better. Um, and the kids enjoyed them so much that I did a Donors Choose grant, and I got a six more. And I've got three of these. If you look at the mats, 
those ones you can customize and like I can take pictures of different books and I can stick them underneath the mats and the kids, I can ask questions about books and the kids will move their bebot to the right answer. And these are two of them. The handmade number mats are good to just, you know, introduce them to bebots and I will have them move from like one number to another. They move a square at a time, but they, are very time consuming to make and they curl up at the end. And I, li I like the ones I got from Donors Choose. There's a better look at those. We also got sequencing cards so the kids could lay out their commands so they could remember what they had programmed into their Bbot. I wanted to connect it with some of our um, local book awards. So the Maine Chickadee Award is a picture book award and teachers and librarians, a committee of them, will pick the 10 best books from books published the year before. And then um, librarians read them to the kids from kindergarten to grade four. So I made a challenge last year and I had pictures of the titles and the kids would move to the right answer and they really enjoyed it. We're gonna do it again this year. So we've done fairy tale challenges. Um, Aesop's Fables, uh, Trickster Tales. So, um, I have links here if, for any, I can send if anybody's interested on where I was able to find these things. And the Perloff Family Foundation is, we've gotten, what, two 3D printers now at school from them. And then Kathy's been doing the um, go-to science with them this year, and I think kindergarten next year is going to do those. And then Lakeshore Learning is where I got the kits, and the Puppet Theater. And I would love to have you come in to the library sometime, and the kids love to have visitors, and you could actually hands-on try some of these things. Um, and we do have a website that you can visit and see what we're up to. I try to update it once a week. Is there any questions? Or? That's, uh, that's really fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Is um, just curious when you've been reading all the different versions. So do you have a discussion about yeah, how we they always relate, compare. contrast, compare, and exactly. And yeah. then do you decide then how the because there, are there are there scripts already written? Or yeah, do you, yeah, I have multiple scripts though in the playbook, so so like you I, can decide which versions. Yeah, you are. I usually try to get whatever is easiest to stage. That just must we be have a really small. great part of the creative process. Yeah, I love That's it. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, who would who would have known there were that many versions of uh, those? That's scripts? nothing. There's like hundreds more. <laughs> That's just scratching the surface. I th and I thought I knew, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but I guess not. I just wonder who, uh, you, you said you per perform the plays for the younger grades. Mm -hmm. Do you, are do, are parents involved? Do you bring, uh, do you do presentations involved? I used to, parents, I used to at my old school, but the, if one student's absent, we have to call all the parents. So I think if I were to do it, I would probably do like a special parent only performance and like, you know, schedule it a certain day, but I haven't here as of yet. We have had some parents come in to um, work with their children, do readers, doing readers theater through our Title I intervention programs. They had a, a literacy open house for parents and kids were able to read through their scripts in their small groups with their parents in that area, but not yet into the full readers theater that we're doing in the library. How, how long do the plays last? I mean, I, I know they vary, but just on average, like five, five or ten minutes, probably five, ten tops. Minutes. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe at some point we can we can ask you to come in and yeah and give us a or, or not you but have the kids come in and, <laughs> yeah and perform oh come in here and do it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I could mention it that it would be it would be interesting to see <laughs> if yep. they're comfortable if you're comfortable doing it if the parents are comfortable it would yeah be, I, I'll mention it <laughs> it might be exciting to see or you could even come if you ever wanted to come into the school too we love to have an audience yeah yeah they're all hands. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. Any questions? Any other questions? No? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, item 8.0, back to the agenda. Uh, committee reports. 8.1 is the high school building project update. Patrick. 
Yeah, as usual, you get a full report from Kyler, our clerk of the works, with pictures and all the detail. And I really ask him to boil it down to four or five major points. So that, um, so one thing that's uh, has been a big deal lately is CMP is currently hooking up permanent power for the building as we speak this week. Uh, interior partition framing is still going on, but it's now on the third floor. So floors one and two is complete. And uh, final slab of. Uh, Flooring will go in this week, and that will go in the auditor Most of it's going in the theater, at the base of the theater, and also the balcony of the theater. And um, from a staff perspective, we've begun the process of looking at furniture for the classrooms and kind of narrowed it down to a couple different options for the majority of classrooms, but we still have a lot of work to do with science labs, with cafeteria furniture, library furniture. Um, and, you know, if you drive by the school now, you can tell there's been a great deal of emphasis placed on the bridge and building up, um, you know, the foundation before the bridge coming off Congress Street there. So that's, you know, an update now. It's, um, you know, there was a, I think, a, I didn't have the pleasure of being at it, but I think it was a four-hour audio-visual meeting today um, that our sta some of our staff were involved with, you know, to, again, talking from everything from um, the Promethean boards that will be in the rooms to the projectors to all of the technical features in the classroom. So a lot of different meetings and commitments from now until uh, June. Any questions? Questions to Patrick? No, we're still on schedule, I guess. Yeah, everything's going fine. And actually, we had a conference call with the Department of Education just recently, and um, we expressed our appreciation for the work that the DOE and Crooker and Harvey is doing, and um, and they were very happy with the progress that we've made so far. So it's still on on budget, and also um, you know we're making the progress that we expect to at this point. That's great, great. Thanks, Patrick. Any questions? Patrick? I just have a quick one. Um, we're a ways out, but how is um, staff? What's the overall pulse on the move? Um, I know it's a little early to get anxious about it, but... Yeah, no, it's not too early. I mean, Devin could probably speak to that better than I can, but, um, you know, we've had some, we've had some initial meetings. Um, you know, our architect has met with staff. We've had staff meetings. Um, we've, uh, the architect and myself, along with the building principals, have met with department heads. Uh, we've, we have a tentative schedule. We've got to flush that out more. We've got to go out for an RFP for a moving company. So we're, we're trying to be proactive, but obviously, um, you know, as a teacher who's been in a place for a long time, or even if you're not, um, you know, moving even your, from your own home to a new home causes a level of um, angst right. for some people. I mean, right. I think there's a percentage that are ready to move tomorrow if we let them, but then there's a percentage that I'm sure um, are a little nervous about it. So yeah, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be easy, um, but I think the nice part is our plan right now is December 15th is that building will be ours to turn over, you know, turn over to us. And then if we're not moving in until February, it allows us to have a little bit more of a, a slow move. Um, so the things that we'll do first is, you know, Dean and his crew need to get in there for technology. Right. Dave needs to get in there. So a lot of that pre-work. Um, so we're looking, we've talked about professional development time next year for Morse and BRCDC. If, how can we, um, train the teachers on some of the technology that's in there and again try to be as proactive as possible but they're for you know for students too I mean a, you know a new facility that's should should be exciting but uh, at the same time you've got to find where you're going and um, you know it's it'll be new that's what I was wondering would it be unrealistic as we get closer to have some community and student involvement as you know as a potential kind of an all hands on deck not with it I understand the technology and all that but if it comes to that, just to help be part of it. If it, if it only, you know, in addition to staff and the moving company, if there could be some community involvement for people who wanted to help. But I think your, uh, your observation, Patrick, is right. You know, there, there's always a level of anxiety associated with, with a move. And, you know, at some level, there, there's, there's resistance to the move too. You know, for any of us who have moved, um, just moved a house, you know, it, the day comes and you say, well, we can do it next week, it's, that's fine. But in this case, I think we just, we have to get it done. So hopefully, uh, the staff, you know, everyone will, will pitch in and make sure we stay on schedule and get this move done for the kids and for the community, so. But thanks, thanks for the, 
the update. I know it, it, it takes a lot, it's taking a lot of staff time. We appreciate the time that you and, and Dave and, and the administrators are putting into this move. So that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item is 8.2 curriculum. Jake, uh, Katie. So we have a couple of handouts coming around as I do an intro. Um, we have the pleasure this evening of hearing a presentation from two um, folks who work at the Maine Maritime Museum, um, Jason Morin and Luke Millardo. Um, and they're gonna share with us um, how our students and many grades um, in the RSU have been involved in the Sense of Place program over the years. So I'm gonna turn the mic over. Thank you, Katie. As Katie mentioned, my name is Jason Moore, and I'm the Director of Programs and Operations at Maine Maritime Museum, and Luke Millardo is our Education Coordinator, so hopefully going around are a couple of handouts for you guys that'll kind of go along with this. Um, at a quick show of hands, how many people have actually heard of the Museum's Sense of Place program before? Perfect. That's why we're here. We're going to tell you about it. Um, so I'm going to start off just giving you a little bit of background history, kind of how the program came to be, because it's kind of interesting. And Luke will talk a little bit about the content and kind of some of the, um, the results and the outcomes that we've been seeing as, as Luke's actually our boots on the ground kind of doing the program. So um, Maine Maritime Museum back in 2015 really started to focus heavily on rebuilding our connections with local schools um, and through field trips. From the, the economic downturn of 2008, we saw our school program attendance really drop over a number of years and around 2015, seemed like things were finally at a stable enough point where we could really kind of rebuild that. So we began talking to a number of stakeholders, um, a lot of the teachers and principals in the area, um, and trying to get some feedback of how the museum could better serve the schools and how we could be a better resource for the schools and, and simply connect better. Um, so through those conversations with the teachers and principals, we started seeing some common themes. Um, one thing that popped up was from almost universally from everybody, was that there were some primary barriers to doing programs with us. And those shouldn't be much of a surprise. It's time, money, and transportation. Those were the three big things that we kept hearing. Uh, we also, in visiting the local schools and walking through the halls, started to just notice ourselves. We didn't really see much culture of the community represented in the school in terms of artwork on the walls or things about the shipbuilding history of this area and things that really led to the unique history of this area. Um, we were also hearing occasionally things from parents, sort of almost threats to their students. If you don't get a good education, you're, you're going to end up working over at BIW. You'll end up working in the yard. That is precisely the opposite message we should be sending. The message should be, you need to get a good education so you can work in the yard because they have some of the top paying and top jobs in engineering and finance and all kinds of different areas. So we really need to, to change that mentality around a little bit. And then lastly, kind of as an overarching thing, we, we really felt there was kind of a misunderstanding or an, an absence of understanding in how truly unique the history of this local area is, particularly um, Bath. So we began to work and develop some concepts of how to utilize a unique history of this community to foster a sense of place and pride in the students and a, sense of, a better sense of their understanding of the, the history of this area so um, that they could better understand the community that they live in and where they fit within that community. So we understood that the program needed to support core elements of the class to reinforce what was happening in the classroom. That kind of helps with that time issue. We understood and recognized that we needed to have multiple visits over multiple years to really have the type of significant impact that we were hoping for. And we also needed to create content at multiple age levels. Multiple visits with just one grade wasn't gonna be enough. We wanted to have connections with students over and over and over again throughout their entire academic career. So we began to develop some programming and some ideas and we pitched it to our board of trustees. And what we had come up with is we wanted to serve every second, every fourth, every seventh, and a number of the 10th grade students over their academic careers. And when we pitched this to the trustees, three of them immediately stood up and said, but you still have to address those barriers, time, money, and transportation. 
And fortunately, we have some really supportive trustees, and they put their money where their mouth was. And we ended up having three trustees donate $75,000 for three years of support of this program, which was just phenomenal. So that allowed us to take staff time to develop the content in the program and continue to work with the schools so that we could actually start implementing it. So in 2016, we actually implemented the first year of the, the um, Sense of Place program. And in that first year, we served or, or put together, um, hosted 41 programs serving 395 students. The seventh grade class that year put together an exhibit. They worked with our curators and with our education staff, and they actually put together an exhibit that we had up in the museum for about two months. Um, and that exhibit was titled Commerce, Culture, and Community, the Sewell Family Shipbuilders. And the students that did that actually understood the connections using one of the Sewell vessels, Durago, its global connection, not only that Bath was a global community and super well connected all around the world at one point in time, but also that those vessels brought back culture with them that have been infused into our culture. So it was great to see that it worked. Um, the second year of the program, the students put together a debate on probably one of the most complex topics you could do. We had the seventh grade students, two of the houses of seventh grade, debated one another on um, fisheries regulations. And they did a phenomenal job, and we actually hosted that as a public forum at the museum. Parents and grandparents, of course, came, but we also had members of the community who showed up and watched that. We had close to 100 people in attendance, and they did a phenomenal job. Um, and then, um, Additionally, 2019, we added the 10th grade students into the program, and I'm happy to say we are now in the fourth year of programming, but we had only initially raised enough money for three years. The museum actually raised another $25,000 through private um, organizations and funds to support a fourth year of programming, which is what we're doing now. So I'm gonna let Luke talk a little bit about that programming and kind of how the, the programs are structured under each grade. So I'll, I'll start with a uh, brief overview of the curriculum, which is in that kind of thinner packet that you have if you want more information. But we start with second grade, as Jason said. They visit twice in the school year, and that focuses on themes of marine transportation and lobstering. So kind of getting at these themes relevant to this place, maritime, transportation, and trade, um, the fishery, fishing industry, and ecology, and an introduction to shipbuilding. And then in the fourth grade, they return, and inevitably we hear all the fourth graders when they walk into the museum say like, oh, I remember it here. They're all really excited to come back. And that's our early Kennebec history and ecology. And that's when we introduce Wabanaki Native Americans and fishing methods. Um, and then we tie that into more contemporary fishing methods and introduce this theme of sustainability and technology developing. Um, and we kind of finish off the year there with a trip on our Merry Meeting cruise ship and we go up the Kennebec so that the students can see Merry Meeting Bay from the water and use that as a sustainability and ecological management, managing natural resources. When they return in seventh grade, again, there's all this enthusiasm, excitement at being back and these themes are kind of now present in their mind. We've built the foundation with them as have their students we work with science teachers and social studies teachers to connect to the curriculum. And our major theme for seventh grade is environmental history of the cod fishery. And that's, we use that as a way to study sustainability and management of natural resources. Um, we also study the balance between the economy and the environment and technological innovations and how that has impacted the fisheries. And it's a way that students can engage in topics that many of them know are very relevant to today in the lobster fishery, but it's in a historical context beginning in the 1500s and going all the way through today. Um, all of our lessons are founded on experiential practices. They all involve real hands-on physical activities from artifact analysis, so they put on their white gloves and ask questions about artifacts that have been found from here, from the place that they live. That's really exciting for them, to games like spear fishing for cucumbers, standing on chairs, or um, simulated fishing from a dory. We set up like a rowing machine and they get to haul in heavy fish on a line. So it's memorable experiences that they have and that ingrain these um, 
themes and topics that are relevant to this place in them. The feedback that we have from students and teachers has all been very positive, indicating that the experience students get at the museum strengthens their understanding of important subjects, um, both enhancing their academic instruction and education that they get in the classroom, as well as building this appreci appreciation for their home, its history, and the natural environment. In that thicker packet that I handed out, you'll find quotes from teachers, um, but as a snapshot, some of them say that when students come to the museum, they become historians, that the learning that happens here is as rigorous at the museum as it is in a classroom, and that you can achieve a different kind, a more robust learning than is possible in the classroom, and that our lessons tie into and support all the teachers' learning objectives, which is a big goal of ours, working closely with the teachers. Thank you, Luke. Um, I just wanted to close with a couple quick things. So we view the program as being extremely successful. Um, we're connecting better with the schools. I think um, the students are getting a better sense of their community that they live in and their place in it. They're understanding they are the next legacy for future generations. So hopefully our, our end goal is we want to try to keep students here, keep them learning, recognize the benefits of being in this community. Um, I would also like to say that not only have we fundraised for the fourth year of the program. We actually just a couple weeks ago got in a final check. We have the fifth year also fully funded so we can take the program through 2021. Um, so that's wonderful. We are working on some longer term funding options. Um, there's one family foundation we're working on right now for three years of funding. It'd be another 75,000. Um, we'll see if we get that or not but I can guarantee through 2021. Um, but what I would ultimately love to see happen is for the program to be valued enough that it slowly over time works its way into the school's budget. Um, we're hearing from teachers that this is a very beneficial resource for them and it really helps reinforce what they're doing in the class, gives some practical application for the kids in a real world setting. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm not asking you guys for money today, but down the road we'll talk. Um, this is something that I'd love to, to see happen. This year it was wonderful. Um, the district did help us a little bit with the transportation costs, so um, we have some all of the transportation costs for the busing covered this year, which is great. That actually relieves a little bit of the burden for us, and I could see over time slowly continuing to work that way. I also wanted to mention really quickly just a couple of the other things that we're doing as well um, that the museum funds for the RSU1 students. So Luke referenced the Mirror Meeting Bay cruise. We actually have a grant from the Mirror Meeting Bay Trust. We, for any community that touches on Mary Meeting Bay, we take every fourth grade student on a boat cruise to Mary Meeting Bay, teach them about the ecology of the bay, and it's just a great opportunity for those kids to get out on the water and see something that they often otherwise wouldn't. Um, we have our discovery boat building program that we do with the Woolwich School as well as a couple of other schools. Um, scholarship fund, so we receive funding from Mary Meeting Bay Trust and Bath PTO also receives some funding from a source. And we actually last year put 50 full scholarships for our summer camp. Um, so between Bath PTO and Maine Maritime Museum, we fully funded 50 kids to go to summer camp. And of course, we always take part in the screen free night. So there's a number of things that the museum's doing to, to try to help out. Thank you all. Thanks, Jason. Luke, um, any questions? I just. I just wanted to thank you um, as we think about the vision and the future of RSU1 and what makes us unique. I mean, I see this partnership also as kind of a branding, right? Because that's something because of who we are and who you are and where we're positioned. You know, I'd really like to see that become something that we can really tout as, as a brand, really, when you start thinking about it that way. But thank you. Thank you. That'd be wonderful. Just Tanner and, and Hayden, have you had any interaction with the program at all? When, when, when did you do the 10th, the 10th grade was 2018? So that, that might have included you. Uh, I have not personally had any Okay, experience. okay, just kidding. Not, I'm not putting you on the spot. I just curious. Maybe. No, it's great. I mean, we do, we do have a very, uh, we live in a very unique area, the museum, there are other groups uh, out there are notably the land trust, Kennebec Estuary Land Trust, that provide educational resources for the school that build on the legacy of this area. I think uh, the programming that you described is is great, um, and and it and it does um, certainly it it uses the uh, 
the attributes of the area in, a, in an educational environment. And that's, that's terrific. Great. Thanks. Yep. Um, thanks for your presentation. I just wanted to ask, is the, maybe I missed it, I know you do uh, some other schools as well. I mean, when you're talking about fundraising, is that just for RSU1 or does it include other districts? Um, the funding I mentioned for the sense of place program, we are only doing that with the RSU1 district. Oh, okay. We're not doing that with anybody else. Okay. The Mary Meeting Bay Trust Fund for doing the Mary Meeting Bay cruises, that's with any of the communities. Right, that and the boat that. building expands a little further too. Exactly. Okay. But the yep. sense of place. All right, sense thank, of place is specific for, for RSU1. Right here. Thanks for the clarity. You're welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Katie, do you have any other comments? curriculum testing related, anything? Thank you both um, for presenting and for all that you've done for our students. We really are appreciative. Um, the board sent a few questions along around testing, so I'm just gonna probably take about two minutes to answer some of those. Um, so one of the first ones was, when are the next testing windows for district assessments? Um, and so the NUIA assessment that we take in grades K through eight um, will be happening in May. The Empower test, which also happens in three through eight, um, they, they usually give us a window time slot and that's from um, March 16th through April 10th. Um, there's also the science test, that's for grades five and eight and that happens at the end of April. The SAT happens mid-April for 11th graders, and the 11th graders also have their science assessment that happens in the beginning of April. So that's, um, so we're coming right up on when all the big state tests and some of the district tests happen. Um, I, I know that we will be taking um, time in a data review meeting as we did last year before an upcoming board meeting. So uh, obviously we're not gonna, I don't, have all the reports and whatnot, um, but I did want to just answer these questions. Um, the student results have all been sent home. We're required by law to send those home. They weren't released to us um, error-free until the end of December, right before vacation, and so we actually sent them home in January um, for the Empower test results. The state was still fixing their online portal um, until I would say mid to late January. I want to say at the last board meeting it wasn't up and running yet. But now, if you are interested, they actually publish some of the information publicly. Um, and I, I, I have a different portal that I go into to see it, but it's really easy for anybody to just go on the MDOE webpage. I tried it myself today to see if it truly was pretty simple, and it is. You just go to quick links and click on assessment, and it's all right there. Um, so it's pretty easy. Um, in terms of what we do with the data as a district, just so we're all on the same page, um, principals were sent some of the overview data from myself. They've all gone in and looked at the information. It's been shared out on various levels with teachers. And, and the sorts of um, conversations that are happening around it are, um, you know, where did we do well? Um, where did we fall short in terms of our instruction? And then what can we do about it? Um, obviously looking at student results for students wh who we might find are struggling um, with different things. And then also just paying attention to some of the subgroups um, within the data. Because um, they do split those um, up when they present us with the results. Um, and also a reminder, the Empower, um, is one day. We actually do a lot more assessing that's much more helpful instructionally with our NUIA, um, with thing, something called Ames Web, um, with our new reading assessments that we've been using that I think teachers find much more helpful on the whole often. Um, just quick brush strokes, how did um, we do? In ELA, I'm happy to report that we improved in all buildings from previous years, um, which is great news and um, I think with all the work we've done on introducing our new assessment program, um, that that's hopefully starting to pay off. Um, with math, um, almost all buildings improved or stayed the same. They still are all above or on par with the state average. 
Um, and for the high school, the 11th graders, SAT, both ELA and math were equal or better to the state. So I'm happy to just quickly report, I know we're not gonna go into detail, that it's um, good news. Any questions? Thanks, Katie. Any questions? Is Empower MEAs? Because I didn't hear MEA at all in any of this. Yeah, that it, MEAs are all the different kinds of assessments. So with it, so MEA is the umbrella, and depending okay. on what grade you're in, you take different MEAs. So if you're you take the Empower, you take the SAT, you take the Science Assessment. Okay. So. Okay. Um, MEA is kind of like ice cream, but underneath the chocolate, vanilla, all those. Okay. For an analogy. That's way more fun than testing. <laughs> all right. Okay. Any Thank you. Any other questions? I know before you, just before you leave the. Sure. And I'm not sure there's an answer here. There was reporting today, I think, of uh, a study, uh, the results of comparison statewide, you know, that, that balanced the the social economic, economic characteristics of On the NPR. district with the with test score results and yeah. showing what isn't particularly surprising but but troubling no. nonetheless yeah that, that um it, it reinforced i mean what what most folks who study education already come to know is that often socioeconomics are directly equated with test scores um, and that's kind of what, I didn't read it, I heard a snippet of it on the news, um, so I don't wanna really speak to that specifically. Um, but I do know that on the main curriculum listserv I'm on, um, one of the curriculum um, leaders who's in a position like mine actually took the public results and plotted them against um, the, the per pupil spending, like sort of the socioeconomic, sorry, the free and reduced lunch percents um, and it, you can see the, with a scatter plot, the line, um, the direct line of the correlation that it creates yeah. between the percent of free and reduce on the test scores, unfortunately. I mean, he just did it out of curiosity. Um, and for both ELA and math, um, it proved to be true. Yeah. I mean, there's just a, you know, we, we, did the, we did the workshop last month on, on mental health issues, and there are those themes that are brought forward into this report, you know, into the, the numbers reported today that, that kids, you know, showing up with, with other stressors in their lives, mm -hmm. whether they be homelessness, um, um, ec you know, economic issues, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, lack of heat, lack of food. Uh, in the home are, right. are clearly all factors that, that are influencing the, mm -hmm. the all, child's Yeah, ability. it all relates back to the ACEs trauma presentation that Devin did, was that two years ago? Um, to the board, or last year, to the board. You're right, yeah. um, you know, it's all directly related. It's obviously hard to learn if you haven't eaten or slept, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Katie. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, 9.0, 9 um, Tanner and Hayden. So um, the high schoolers just got back from February break and we are getting right into the full swing of things again. Not only are spring sports starting, I saw the track team running when I drove in tonight, but our drama department is preparing for John Russell's My BSF or My Best Support Friend, um, and that is his play for the MPA's uh, One Act Play Festival or competition. Um, uh, additionally, our school is also beginning auditions for our Adams Family musical. Um, and then coming up later on this month, we also have the Creative Writing Club, Teen Library Council, and Pan Free Library all collaborating to present a sit-down murder mystery dinner, which everyone in the community is invited to. I, looking back at February, I have a couple notes. Uh, senior Emma Rothwells was selected as one of five finalists at the regional MPA Poetry Out Loud event. Um, and then February was a huge month for Morris Athletics, so here comes a long list of excellence. Uh, senior Deja Douglas is the girls state champion in her uh, weight class for wrestling. And then in swimming, we had junior Evan Willerts finish first in the 100 yard backstroke in states and first in the 200 yard IM at states. Uh, senior Olivia Harper was first in the 100-yard backstroke and first in the 100-yard butterfly. 
Haley Harper was first in the 100 yard backstroke and first in the 200 IM. And then in indoor track, we had William Carrollton win state championship in shot put and uh, junior Aiden Pryor is advancing to New England's. Um, and then also a quick little shout out to a student started and student operated club, the 826 Ski Squad uh, got their feet under themselves officially this month, I believe, started uh, going around skiing and uh, it seems to be a success. Everybody seems happy on the ski squad. Great, great. Thank you both, thanks. Um, okay, item 10.0, superintendent's report, Patrick. Yeah, so I'm pleased to announce that uh, we received a school revolving renovation fund application. Um, it was approved by the state and the application was approved for a steam to hot water conversion project at Dyke Newell. And so the amount funded is 365,000 and this will go through the main municipal bond bank. Uh, the portion of the loan to be forgiven is 187,000 and the portion to be re repaid is 178,000. Uh, the length of the loan is five years and the interest rate is 0%. So this is a project that we needed to have done at Dyke Newell regardless. And now because of applying for this, um, you know, half of it, approximately half is forgiven and then 0% interest. So we were excited to um, receive that news a couple weeks ago. Uh, this was ironically mentioned tonight as part of the Dyke Newell uh, presentation, but I had the opportunity to visit and you saw in your backup, I think the go-to science classes. Uh, we have, you know, probably a handful of 10 in the district, and it's just a, a great opportunity to see students, in this case it was a first grade classroom, how excited they get about authentic learning, and these are two um, scientists slash teachers that are, you know, you're seeing them live up on the screen, and the teachers are asking them questions during the class. I mean, they said hello to me and Miss McKay as we're sitting there in the class, but they're someplace in a different country, and they're talking about different animals and creatures, and uh, it really brings science to life, and the students and the 3D printers that you heard about today. So we're hoping some of that was funded through um, different grants, but also the PTA um, gave some money because it isn't, it, you know, it's not a cheap program to do, but I think it's one that, as a district, we need to look at um, doing in some of our early elementary grades um, across the district. Uh, very impressive. Uh, we had six Special Olympians participate in snowshoeing and slalom events at the Special Olympics in Sugarloaf. And I also had the opportunity to attend a couple of unified basketball games, um, which were very refreshing and rewarding to watch. Uh, Mr. Vardy put in his report to you that several Morse programs um, have been selected as recipients of grant money. The Berlin City Auto Group is supporting our AP Bio students and currently working on a service learning project to help design native landscapes around the new school that will be friendly to native bee populations. And the Berlin City also chose to support our unified athletics program. And then additionally, Morse's AP Computer Science program received financial support for the second year from the Amazon Future Engineering program. Um, Morse's Ocean Bowl, who you just approved their trip a little while ago, they had, uh, both teams had strong finishes. They came in um, at the regional competition at UNH. They came in fifth and third place. Um, so they're looking forward, it's a young team, they're looking forward to going back next year. And then just lastly, the school nu nutrition program was reviewed in January and Tim Harkins was commended on his leadership of the program and the reviewers also praised the staff for the healthy meals, the different options, and really how they engage students and interact with students while still meeting federal guidelines. So I just wanted to pass it on to you as well. And that's it. Thanks, Patrick. Any questions of Patrick? No. Yeah, Tim is doing a great job with food service. We've, we've come a long ways there. Uh, Deb, financial report. Good evening. Um, I just have to point out before I get started is to thank you to our own Josh Tata for building us a new podium that's not falling off its wheels over in the corner. <laughs> you did a nice job. Um, tonight we're looking at January, the seventh month um, of our year, and things are going well and as expected. Um, and at this point in the year, we have spent $16.7 million out of a $33.7 million budget. Um, we have an encumbered amount of 
almost 12 million, which is the remaining salaries and benefits for the year. Um, so we're at 49%. Last year it was 51, so we're spending pretty much like we did before. Um, operation and maintenance this year with this beautiful day today made us think that, you know, I had to look at the gallons that we've used for fuel, and we're about 20,000 less um, than we were last year at this time. So that's a good thing. We're saving a little bit of money there so far, so hopefully that continues. Uh, revenue, we've brought in 18.4 million, which is 54%, which once again is in line with last um, year. And let's see, we've had, um, we're gaining on our interest on investments from what we budgeted, so next for the 2021 budget, I'll increase that revenue a little bit. And we received a, which you don't see here on this report, but we did receive a CTE grant of 56,000 for additional equipment for um, our vocational program. So, and Morse High School, we've spent 47.74%, so about 35 million, so we're almost halfway through that. Questions? Great, thanks. Questions of Deb? I Deb? Have, I have oh. a quick one. Did yep, you have one? I do, but okay. you first. We can get into this in Finance Committee, but how is our substitute line looking uh, for substitute teachers? How's that looking this year? We're at about um, 109,000 remaining. So, you know, we we'll average about 20,000 per pay period. Now, there'll be some that aren't so much. So we probably will be pushing pretty close to what we have budgeted for substitutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted just to let you know that by the end of this week, I will email you all your budget presentations, and I'll also have hard copies next week, but you can at least get a chance to look at all those pages. Great. Thank you. Deb, I, I have, are you? I'm done. That's it? Yep. Okay. Well, this involves you partially, too, uh -oh. or, or maybe wholly. Um, <laughs> Justin's uh, report on special ed, um, he talked oh, yeah. about the changes in the main yeah. care legislation, and, and um, the reason I Point of Lorna because Lorna is doing our legislative tracking at this point. But I mean, we're, what what risk do you see here? I, there's a couple of things that he said in his report, which I, I questioned. I just have a question mark next to that. That he he indicated that some of the more recent changes in the reimbursement process wouldn't affect us because we don't bills we don't bill those services. Did you happen oh, to see his report? Okay. Um, I know what he's talking about. There are some districts uh, years ago that used to do their own billing to main care. I mean, and it's a huge process. And we used to, years ago, hired Main State Billing to, to do that. But things change, so now what happens is these outside districts actually bill main care, and when main care actually pays them, then we receive the reduction in our subsidy. So it's all a timing thing. It's always unknown. It's hard, it's been hard to budget because you just never know when you see a report saying how much they're going to reduce your subsidy by, it may involve months before of services for particular students. So, okay. um, so our biggest well, challenge will remain just keeping on top of how much our subsidy will be reduced yeah. instead of Well, his, his second or third paragraph of his report, um, he really does raise some real concern about, you know, the, the, proposed, the effect of the proposed legislation on those outside providers, uh, which, I mean, I mean, his point, I guess, is that if, if we don't pay these entities that are going to go out of business and, and, and that's simply going to either deny our students access to the services or it's going to make the services out there much more costly. So I think, I think his, I, if, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, obviously, and he's not here, but it, it sounds like his concern is that 
you know, we, we will have to find more out of state, out of area providers for some of these services, which will only increase the costs. And, and yeah, uh, he would have to, you know, speak to what he was referring to. I yeah. do know. I, that I guess I would just, I, you know, rather than get too much into the weeds, maybe it's a conversation that, that, and, and maybe Patrick has some insights here too that you could, you can have, so yes. that as we go into the budget season, we're not, you know, I mean, it's always been my theme that, that special ed is eating up more and more of our budget, and it seems like we're on track to do that once again, but. Uh, yeah, their, their I'll, speak, costs I'll speak to him tomorrow and see what he was, yeah. you know, his concerns. No, I, I mean, I think it'll come up next week in our finance committee meetings. And really, it's just saying that we don't bill for main care ourselves. And that, um, but some of the places that we send our students, if there is cuts to main care, that uh, those facilities will start to charge more or they'll put more restrictions on it. So it, will, it could end up hurting our students in a big picture. But again, when he makes his presentation next week, I'm sure he'd be happy to you know, elaborate on that. that. That's what I was wondering too, is if when he presents on Mon he presents Monday, right? I think, so. I think he does, that we can yeah. certainly raise those yeah. questions. Yeah. And hopefully we, we, I mean, this is an area where we obviously don't want to over, um, no, we don't want to under-commit funds because of the unknowns, you know. Right. Right. Um, and and um, it's happened to us before, I think, where we've 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 had a we've had a couple of years that yeah, it was a surprise, and it's basically because you can't track how they're going to pay those outside vendors. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's a hard okay. target. So I can find okay. those LDs too. Well, if I can clarify you know? some of it. It's it's not an actual LD. What it was, it it came about because DHS was proposing a rule change in main care. Um, right now, those outside providers that provide for those children that we send out of district, um, they bill under a section of main care, um, section 28 and 65 typically, and um, DHS had proposed recategorizing some of those services under a new section called 106. And they had buried in there some significant reductions in the reimbursement rates that would actually end up closing some programs, probably like Margaret Murphy Center in Lewiston and Auburn was really worried that they would have to close their doors. Um, it was also limiting um, the number of hours of service children could receive in those programs. It was going to shorten their school day and their school year. And these are kids who need services year round. Um, so there was some real strong concerns. There was a lot of outcry about it. And um, because there was a particular LD involved around um, CDS and moving three-year-olds into public schools, that was um, ruled ought not to pass by the legislature. So because that's tabled, DHS has now tabled the discussion around adding Section 106. Um, and I'm probably speaking Greek to a lot of people, but that's kind of... All of this has sort of been set aside for now, um, and it probably won't come up again for a little while. DHS yeah. will want to revisit this this new section of main care eventually, but not right away. Probably in next year or something. Okay. It'll be a while. So well, we have we'll we'll have questions for Justin then when we see him. Okay. Great. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. Um, uh, old business eleven point. Oh, uh, 11.1 is a review of our 1920 goals. Jen, uh, who is uh, sent to regret, she's not feeling well, is usually walks us through this. So I, I propose we just move beyond this and we'll get the update at the, at the next month's meeting. 12.0, new business, 12.1. This is an action item, I think, action. Uh, the new Morse High Health elective proposal and it's included in your packet, Patrick. Speaker. Yeah, Maria and Eric you know, offered to be here tonight, um, but really this is pretty self-explanatory. It's a half credit, it's an elective, so we're, gonna, we're proposing to add this to the course of study, and it would be dependent, though, on the number of students that you know have enough sign-up to be able to offer it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I guess you call it an upper-level health class, health elective, and what I really like about it is you know, that mental health piece is in there, which supports a lot of what we're doing as a district. So um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but we can try to answer any questions you might have. 
Any questions? Is, is there any cost to it? No, Mar Maria, in, within her schedule, can fit this in next year. Yeah. I'm just curious, how did it come up that they just, I mean, it just thought it would be good to have an advanced class, or? Yeah, I think she's been approached by some students, and I think it'd just be, okay. again, another way to, um, you know, hopefully students will sign up, and you saw the topics. Uh, yeah, that yeah no, are the topics are really good. I was just very curious applicable. how it was developed. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I didn't hear. Did you say it's in her existing schedule? Like she's just going to work in her schedule, so she doesn't. It wouldn't need any new curriculum requirements or anything. Okay. Okay. If you get if we get good enrollment, a lot of interest, it may it may go beyond this. Uh, maybe later. Maybe later. Uh, again, you know, much of what you uh, much of what you read and, and Maria, you know, has indicated as the uh, curriculum for this for this uh, um, this course are again the same themes that we heard with our mental in the mental health presentation, you know, last last week or last month rather. And I think I think um, it's great that you know we're trying to address some of those concerns. No, I, I think it's great. I just, by design, you mean, does she pull from a variety of resources, or? Do you want, if, if you want to, why don't you go up to the podium and so we, we have your, your answer on uh, recorded. So she, um, is very passionate. She's, she does. She is constantly looking for different ways to find integrative ways to bring health to the kids. So she does a lot of looking at what other schools are doing, taking pieces, really developing a holistic curriculum. So she does not. It's not like a bot curriculum that she's bringing and then giving it to it. It's, she's designing different ways to connect kids to all different areas of health. So from websites and periodicals and speakers and things like that yeah. some she has used community based speakers she's used you know she's looked at different programs she's had articles she's had she is a wonderful addition to Morris she's constantly looking ways at what is being done you know at the, at the state level she has a lot of different colleagues that she talks to she specifically around this course has a a colleague that she's talked to around what have they done, how have they engaged students, and looking at how to have this this holistic, healthy lifestyle. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, thanks, Devin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So this is an action item. Um, so we would need a motion to approve the no, move to approve the course I'll curriculum. I'll okay, we have a motion by Lou, second by Megan. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Okay, thank you. All right. 12.2, um, we have uh, several uh, policies that are here for the first reading. And this is an opportunity for the board to, uh, they'll come back at, your, at the uh, March meeting for action. Uh, this is an opportunity to raise questions, and Megan's here. She'll answer all of them. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so first, we, we have IHBAC child fine policy. Any questions? Concerns? No? All right. JJIAA private school students access to public school co-curriculum interscholastic and extracurricular activities this this was a uh, this was discussed by a parent at our last meeting it went back to the the policy committee for some um, recommendation well you know to take a look at it again to to clarify some 
uh, ambiguity regarding the responsible who had responsibility to sign off on a student's participation um, we have talked to our um, the district's attorney and Patrick has uh, elicited some uh, some of the neighboring districts to look at their policy and and, and those similar? policies are comparable I don't know if you want they're comparable Absolutely. Yeah, one, one that I I, I do have one question that that on on the second page of the uh, the policy in the recommended language it it talks about students enrolled in a private school and then it says the private school student will not be permitted to, to try out at, a, at another place in the policy it it talks it refers to an equivalent instructional program it says a student enrolled in an equivalent instructional program must request and receive separate written approval. And then the language switches a little bit to talk about students enrolled in a private school. And, and I, I, I think they're meant to be used. Um, you're not drawing a distinction between those two, I don't think. But I would just ask you to go back and take a look and, and, and adopt comparable language you know for for both I think so the process is clear. yeah I think equivalent instructional program is is probably the clearer mm -hmm. and more inclusive way to to describe this than than a private school because private schools might be not-for-profits they might have other kinds of mm -hmm. legal identity so any any other questions on this on this one so you're saying private union so like if it were a charter school or something like that yeah i don't i don't know a charter school is not a private i mean you have no, it's public not private you so have I'm public charter yeah. yeah so you're saying specify that it's all schools that are doing that it'd be an equivalent instructional program which okay, is the more inclusive okay. at least i think i yeah. think that no, yeah that's that's, that's cool. a separate policy on charter school oh we do you do that, that, that mirrors this yes oh okay okay I had a quick um, when in the request for request for writing is there an actual form that we can give someone or is this just kind of free you know just a you know is there a, a, there a form that like here's here's how you put the request in in writing it hasn't been a form but I mean it's worked pretty well that the couple of principles it's been a, just a quick email um, you know, okay. so that you know somebody doesn't have to scan something or you know fill something out. So it's just that I want to participate in this sport. Um, you know, if so. And then the other question I had, um, and I know it's not an action item, but um, when it says something about um, oh my gosh, the capacity. It talks about capacity. I'm trying to get my eyes on it here. I guess the question I have is how do you, sometimes do you know that you don't have capacity until you have tryouts? In other words, students are not allowed to try out if the school doesn't feel they have capacity. I think it's in, on page two. The RSU student will not be denied, will never be denied an opportunity to try out. Well, I think I think the, the, judge, sorry, the judgment is that if if there are more people, if there are more RSU one students who have signed up to try out, then then yeah, then I, I that's understand. It. I just wonder if we know, you know, who's. Had, I mean, some some kids don't follow through. Some you know, well, then not to get the, you know, if that's the case, if if 15 people sign up to try out who are who are students, and only 10 of them show up, but there's another you know there there's there there's a a, a kid enrolled in an equivalent instructional program who's indicated interest. I mean, if you know if if there would be that opportunity to perhaps I, I, submit the request. I, I, I would think. You know, there, there, there might then be the opportunity for that, for that kid to show up mm -hmm. for a trial. Well, that was that was my only wonder. Okay. okay. I think.
think the intent, the intent of the policy is to give, to give that clear preference to RSU one students to participate on the team, right? On the team, yeah. right? Yeah. That's something that that the committee can can speak to at the next meeting can raise that question amongst ourselves. Okay. Forced before second reading, right? Okay, um, the next one we have is um, BCA uh, board member code of ethics. Any questions on that? If not, uh, KE public concerns and complaints. I just, I had to, some wording things that I'll pass down to you. Um, JLCB immunization requirements for students entering RSU one schools. I just wonder with the with the item on the uh, with the referendum item, you know this this may change obviously. So yeah, I mean the committee certainly certainly discussed this. This is all coming. Our changes are coming directly from the nurses just to update the types of immunizations, but it could change um, in the spring. Any questions on that one? Um, JICJ, student use of cell phones and other electronic devices. There's there's a there's a lot going on in this one, and I and I, my comment is that I hope they all conform. There's board policy, there's administrative procedure, there are school rules. Um, I assume everything is in conformity on on, on this, but um, and a student code of conduct. So there there are several different places where this policy needs to be consistently. Um, consistently applied on on the second page of this one page two uh, just the top line student cell phones and other electronic devices may be subject to search if there's a reasonable suspicion of a violation um, I, I assume that that legally we can do this to search a device and and my question was who can do it can can a, can a Administrator do it? Only administrators, not teachers. No. Okay. Actually, I had a, can I go back to the board member code of ethics for a second? Sure. I had a question. Um, you got rid of Q on there, it looks like. The one about if there's a conflict of interest refusing. Cube. Yeah. Yep. I was just, I mean, I, I, I think it's fine that people engage in discussion, but I just wondered, I didn't see anywhere else where, I would think you just want some opportunity to disclose that there may be a conflict of interest. That's just fair that, you know, and then fine, continue in the discussion and you can decide if it's, you know, something you should not vote on, but I, I wasn't sure why that was taken out or when it should maybe just be modified. Or if you had, I mean, maybe you had a great reason for it. I just, that's why I'm asking. I don't honestly remember right, right now. Okay. okay. Well, well, if you just, could just, just look at it, because I yeah. just think it's, yeah. it's conflict of interest. I'm less concerned about if someone wants to, you know, I think it's great to continue in a conversation, mm -hmm. but it should be disclosed if there is some kind of conflict of interest. That should be in there somewhere. Right. And I didn't see it on the, I read through, I didn't see it anywhere else. So however you want to, maybe you just want to rephrase that one. Okay, then we have BEA, board member use of social media. Any questions on that? BEA is electronic mail. BEB is the new one, social media that we just got tonight. Well, that's interesting. You're right. 
So BEB is board member use of social media, and BEA is the one that was included in your agenda, which is, yeah, let's talk about that one first. It's the, the, email. the director's use of electronic mail. And yeah, I think that was straightforward. Okay, yeah. any questions on that? We just can't conduct a meeting on right. Facebook. Right. Right. And then the added, the added one, BEB, which is board member use of social media. Right. No, that just seems like it followed the code of ethics pretty well. So. Yeah. Any questions? So um, there's a there's a couple if they could if the policy could committee could just look at wording on a couple of those that'd be great. Um, Can I ask something real quick on the cell phone? Have has administrators seen sure. the cell phone policy changes? Is that? Yeah, we send it out. Any anything that usually impacts you know administrative staff, we send out to have okay. their input on. Okay. Um, like I think we had Dean weigh in. He weighed in on. Okay. Okay, so these will these will all be action items at the March meeting. Or or not, but that's that's the way they're slated right now. Okay, uh, item thirteen point oh, this is our second public comment period. Opportunity for the public to raise any questions or concerns that might not be otherwise on the agenda. If not, thank you. Uh, 14.0, set next meeting dates and location. So 14.1, the next board meeting will be March 23rd at the Woolwich School at six o'clock. And again, it would be, it would be great if we were able to turn out some Woolwich residents and you know, the opportunity to take a look at some of those budget items that might affect the school that folks might have concerns about. Um, this, this would be the ideal time for some of those concerns to be discussed. 14.2, uh, uh, there is a public forum on the proposed budget and that's the March 30th uh, meeting date uh, at, here at the middle school at six o'clock, and that's for the first reading of the uh, first reading of the budget. And again, more and unfortunately, in my experience, a lot of those meetings are are attended by by the administrative team to answer questions, <coughs> and we have no one in the audience to ask the questions. So, to the extent that that as 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 board members, we can we can get the word out there that this is a, um, a first and a, a good opportunity to to start that public budget process it would it would be it would be helpful for us so that, that would be that would be wonderful okay no other business 15.0 um, motion to adjourn motion by Lou second by Bill with his good arm <laughs> All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.